Get rolling. I'm going to take the chair of my knees to be recovering from being cut open last week. Not doing too badly there. Right up, so what I'm actually doing today is probably starting where most courses in finance would actually begin without the material that you uh, covered in the last couple of weeks, but just to go through some of that stuff. Uh, as I've shown you, the, the neoclassical theory of how individuals behave itself is an irrational theory. And even if you pretend that it's okay, it still doesn't work to drive the market demand curve. And then on top of that, the theory of supply doesn't work because what you told us profit maximizing provably doesn't maximize profits. It's actually a mathematical error to say that it does. And the real reason that neoclassical you know, like it so want that so much is because unless they can make price equal to marginal cost, then they can't get a supply curve that's independent of the demand curve. An essential part of the whole you know, X marks a slot analysis is the two curves are independent of each other. If you move one curve and necessarily move the other, you haven't got a theory. And as I showed you, that's, that's the situation there. Now, as usual, even if you pretend all that's okay, the theory of finance still falls over. So I'm starting now where most courses would begin. And that's to sort of try to prove to you that you're irrational, according to the way that neoclassical economists define rational in finance markets. Here's a few choices for you. Get your pen out, get ready to take a choice. Which would you do? I'm going to give you two choices, A or B. A is you get $1,000 for sure. No questions asked. Bang, $1,000 in your pocket. Or B, I give you a gamble where you have a 9 in 10 chance of getting $2,000 and a 1 in 10 chance of losing 1000 okay. So first one, 1000 bucks for sure. Second, maybe 2000 9 out of 10 chances. 1 out of 10, you lose $1,000. So which do you prefer of those two? Write it down. <coughs> yeah, in the first case, I give you $1,000. In the second case, I think, you've got to give me a thousand. That's right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, you've got to pay. Well, I, I give you a thousand dollars for sure in the first case, or I give you two thousand dollars, nine out of ten chance of that. Or I take a thousand dollars off you. If you don't get the two thousand, I take a thousand dollars off you. So which would you prefer, A or B? A. Okay, let's keep on going. Here's B. <laughs> I want to see you get an idea. Here's another nothing at all. So for sure, you need to lose nor win any money. Or a fifty percent chance of me giving you one hundred and fifty. Or a fifty percent chance of me taking a hundred dollars off you. So I toss a coin. Heads, you get 150. Tails, you give me 100. Okay? Which would you choose, A or B? Okay, now this one, final one. Sure, I'm going to take 100 bucks off here. You choose option A, you're giving me $100. Or option B, you have a 50, a head, a toss of coin, head or tails, chance of either getting $50 or losing 200. So I take 100 bucks off here, or you have a toss of a coin, maybe you get 50, maybe you lose 200. A bit tougher, isn't it? Okay, so what are your choices? Who? Let's go through them. Uh, that's, that's the class, I'll just uh, delete that quickly. So who here goes for the um, option A in the first one? Yeah. Pardon? Oh, oh my God. I was wondering. <laughs> Sorry about that. We got the options in. Okay, there are your choices. Then I'll make a good recording on you. So I'm putting the lectures up on probably on Thursday. I've been so busy, I haven't had a chance to do it. I'll put the lectures and the recording up probably on Thursday. If those are your options. Who goes for A in the first case? Okay, who goes for B? Okay, that's sort of about a 60-40 breakup, I would say. And then in the second, who goes for A? Who goes for B? Okay, that's sort of about, about a 40-60. And who goes in the third one, who goes for A? I'm sorry, but who goes for B? Okay, that's sort of about a 20-80. Okay. 
But let's just take a look at what actually happens when this is run experimentally. Most of the time, what most people choose is A in the first two cases and B in the third. So you, did, you pretty much did the standard. Let's just take a look at that. Yeah, you bounce around a bit on the second one, probably because you've done too much, uh, too many courses in finance. That's it. Because that's that's what most people choose. But according to economic theory, you should have chosen B in all cases. So in fact, if I'd said yeah, why B in the last? in the last one? I'll show you in a second on the next slide. But what you've all done, like the majority of the classes when I said, when I set this exam or this this question. If I, this, these were multiple choice questions in a typical finance course, you would have got, you would have passed one out of three. You'd be on average failing a conventional course in finance. Okay? Because you've been doing this sort of stuff and you're doing all your finance courses so far for multiple choices. And therefore the way that economists look at this say, well most people must be irrational then. The reason they say it's rational to choose B is that you're supposed to be maximizing the sum of your expected returns. Okay. So you look at each of those cases. In the first case, A gives you $1,000 with certainty, whereas B gives you a 0.9 chance of 2,000, that's worth 1,800, minus a 0.1 chance of 1,000, that's $1,700. So B is worth more than A, so you should have chosen you know, B if you were rational, according to economists. Most of you chose A instead. B, uh, exactly value of zero, Second case, A is respect to Alex 25. In the third case, you lose 100 in the first one and lose 75 in the second. Okay, so in each case, the higher, even though it's negative in the third one, the higher uh, expected return is the third option. So why do you think most people don't make the choices economists expect? Okay, risk aversion, that's one. Any other reasons? Yeah, yeah, yeah. High return, higher risks. <laughs> Often people say they, they emotionally don't just just want to gamble. They choose the more certain outcome, regardless of whether it's positive or negative. All sorts of reasons. I'm going to give you another reason. Uh, so this this I went through that last week. I won't actually um, I'd give you the whole list, but things like people being risk averse, not being able to make calculations. Uh, Avoiding gambling, which is even different to risk averse, of course, all that sort of stuff came out. But what I want to do now is try another option that nobody normally thinks first off. And that is, I'm going to give you exactly the same gambles now, only rather than saying if you pick it, it only happens once, whatever option you pick, you have to repeat a hundred times. Okay? So here we take a look at them again. First option, a hundred repeats of getting a thousand dollars for certainty. So choose option A. Ultimately, I'll give you $100,000 100 times. So you work up with $100,000. Or in B, you play the gamble 100 times. So I you know, spin a reel that wheel, 10, put 10 holes in it, and 9 out of the 10 holes, you'll get 2,000. 1 out of the 10, you get minus 1,000. And I do it 100 times. You have to play the game 100 times. Which would you choose, A or B? Write it down. Huh? Let's just talk about it in a second. Write, write it down A and B, get some sort of idea. A or B for the first one. Okay, now we have another one. 100 repeats of nothing at all. So you, you play, the, you sit there 100 times, they do nothing. Or 50 50 chance, just toss a coin, 150 heads minus 100 tails. Again, so repeating it. Well, it's 50-50 odds. I'm just tossing a coin a hundred times. Heads and tails. Yeah, yeah. Well, what are, what are the odds of tossing a coin? Yeah. And the last one, for sure I take $100 off here. A hundred times. So I take $10,000 off here. Or I give you a gamble where you have a 50-50 chance of gaining 50 or losing 200. Which do you play? Okay, have you look at look them down, and I got that's the sort of breakup I got in the day class, fifteen percent eighty-five. Let's see who would have chosen A one. for one. Who would have chosen B? Pretty much the way the day class went. Who choose A for option two? 
Nobody. Who chose B? I voted A. Okay, okay. And who chose A for the last one? Who chooses B? Notice you're all suddenly rational. Okay? What you're doing now conforms with economic theory. So it's something to do about doing things many, many times. Okay? And the usual story is when, when every time I've done this, people have flipped over and most people have chosen what conventional theory says is rational. Okay? Some didn't. Okay? So why do you reckon the difference? Why is it different to do something once versus doing it a hundred times? Yeah? Exactly. What we're looking at in the case of a one-off is uncertainty. Even though you're told what the odds are, you simply can't know what's going to happen on one spin. But if you do it a hundred times, then the probability you've been told will rule out, will, will, will fall out of the repeated instances. Even if like, you're not guaranteed you're going to get a viral that a hundred times, you won't get precisely 90 of those turning up. To, you might get 88, you might get 86. But even there you can calculate what the range is. You know, what sort of spread are you likely to get? So standard deviation uh, and average outcomes, all that sort of stuff make plenty of sense when you're working with repeated instances. It doesn't work when you're working with a one-off because you've got a difference between what you can call subjective probability to what you think you're going to get, what you hope you're going to get, out of a one-off turn, or um, and in that particular case there, what, what you get in that subjective one-off case, you only get one or the other. You don't get the expected value. Either you get $2,000 or minus $1,000. So all the stuff in the economic theory that tells you you've got to calculate the expected value and then take the one with a higher value pretends what you actually get is the expected value. But if you do it once, you can't possibly get the expected value. You either get really good or really bad. Okay? And it's then all the emotional subjective stuff that comes into that that determines what you do. So you either get, with A you get guaranteed $1,000, with B you either plus 2 or minus 1000 And most people look at that and they said, it's not worth my while to gamble that I may get 2000 bucks to risk 1000 if you're going to give me $1,000, I'll take it. It's not the same thing as being risk averse. It's something different. It's the fact you don't actually get the expected value return. So why have you had years and years of subjects in finance teaching you to maximize expected value? And something sick there. Because you don't actually get what they tell you your calculations will return. So if you do the repeated gamble, on the other hand, you do. Because if you do it a thousand, hundred times, or a thousand times, or ten thousand times, ultimately it's going to converge to the average of the number of rolls. You know, you get a bit of a variation, but you can rely upon it happening that many times. So in the first case, with A, you're going to get a hundred thousand dollars, which is a certain option. But you play the game, you're going to get about seven hundred and seventy thousand dollars. It will take a few thousand dollars. So anybody who took option A over option B is not just being risk averse, they're being very bad calculators of probability. Okay? It's not a particularly big thing. So the, the one-off gamble is fundamentally uncertain. You simply don't know that the outcome is going to be, it won't be 0.9, when you roll, when you, when you, when you roll the 10-sided dice, it won't turn up you know, on, balanced on the edge so that you get 0.9 of the 9 sides and 0.1 of the 1 side. It will be on one of those sides, so like a rolling a dice. So probability can't tell you which side's going to come up. So at a subjective level, you've been told that those are the odds, but objectively, you can't tell what's going to happen. So the expected value is no guide to what you're actually going to get back. And what you do get back in that one-off go is uncertain, not probabilistic, but uncertain. Now, that's the main reason finance theory is a waste of time. Conventional finance theory. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe slightly different. You look at, say, deal or no deal. Pardon? Yeah, yeah, deal or no deal. Yeah. So, so that's when someone increasingly along the line is faced with an unexpected. Uncertain decision, even mm. if they don't work out the probability of getting a 
higher or lower. Mm. And yet, if you choose to play, uncertainty can do it. Yeah. It's a. Well, I think the, the problem is because the amount of money they're being offered each time continues to rise. If they actually, like in that particular game when they play it, if they turn over, a, a, you know, like the one dollar, and they've still got up to was it a hundred thousand dollars maximum, is it or? But two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. Then the, when they if they offer you a deal or no deal, will you take the one dollar or will you continue playing? It's just ridiculous the difference between what you're taking away and what you you might take away. But it keeps on getting further and further. And, and what they're doing, they're chopping off ends of the distribution as they go. But it's a very clever game in that sense. It sucks people into keep on wanting to try because the returns that they get aren't just a case of you know, rolling a dice. You're also eliminating options as you go along. So it's, it's very cleverly played, that one. I think there's a lot of interesting psychology being played in that particular game. It goes beyond the simple examples I'm giving here. Yeah, but it, I know I watch that game occasionally and it's amazing to watch people's Emotional. No, I don't do the. <laughs> I watch it for the fun of the emotional reaction. But what I want to say is, explain why have you been taught a theory that is obviously wrong about how people behave and applying the wrong model to working out decisions in finance? And the thing is, this all began from the work of a mathematician called von Neumann. Ever heard of the name von Neumann before? John von Neumann? Anybody? Okay, your computers, the, tech, the, the strict definition of the way in which the computer, the central processing unit inside all your computers works, is called von Neumann architecture. That's the extent to which this guy had an impact upon human society, one of the great geniuses of, of mankind. And what he did back uh, in the 1940s, I think, with working with an economist called Morgenstern, he applied some of his ideas. He, he loved gambling, he loved games of chance, and he loved analyzing them. And working out mathematical models literally of how people behave in game situations that you would love pulling apart deal or no deal. But I wouldn't be a major, there's a part of his book that covers that area. But he wrote a, a book with Morgan Stern about applying the theory of games to what happens in the economy, for economic behaviour. And what he was actually trying to do, and this, yeah? No, you're thinking there of John Nash. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd rank von Neumann ahead of John Nash any day of the week. Uh, Nash is no idiot, but in terms of insight, much better insight into von Neumann. And this was a sideline for him, actually, as, as was uh, the whole economic thing for, for, for Nash, who was mainly a mathematician. So what von Neumann is trying to do was use the theory of gains to make utility a calculable thing. Because he actually thought that indifference curves were nonsense. But the weird thing is, typical economists, they borrowed part of what von Neumann did and applied it to economics to develop the capital asset pricing model. Now, if you look at them, these guys who knew the distinction, which we've just taken through between objective and subjective. And they insisted you had to use objective probability for what they were trying to achieve. Which is weird, because if that's what they insisted upon, why did economists not do it? Usual story, very, very bad scholarship in economics. Not really checking the idea at all. So this is von Neumann and Morgenstern writing back in 1944. And they say that probability can be visualized as subjective. You know, you're estimating what's likely to happen. And he said, since we propose to use this to construct a numerical estimate of utility, meaning we're trying to get a way of saying, you're going to get 7.3 utils out of consuming that, tro that shopping trolley full of goods versus 7.4 from another. He said, we don't, they, they therefore cannot use subjective probability. Therefore, the simplest procedure, and notice the word they use there, is to insist upon the perfectly well-founded interpretation of probability as frequency in long runs. Now, how on earth can a bunch of economists miss the word insist and use subjective probability rather than objective? in that situation. This is why I've got you reading the originals, even though it's really, really hard work to do it, the weird stuff and so on. You see the originals, you can see where the distortions occur as well. So this should never have been used in the way it's been used in finance. It was a mistake right from the outset. And yet this is what was actually done. Now what they were trying to do, they were, they criticized, they were critical of economic theory. Von Neumann in particular couldn't stand Samuelson's idea of indifference curves. 
You probably couldn't stand Samuelson as well. I don't know that particular one. But he rejected the whole idea of indifference curve. This is how he did it. And this is quite quite a cute statement given what I took you to in the last couple of weeks. He said, using indifference curves to describe individual behavior implies either too much or too little. They said, if you can't compare an individual's preferences, in other words, if you can't do the comparison of one shopping trolley to another, and I showed you the two weeks ago, you can't. Okay? So he's saying if you can't do that, then you can't derive indifference curves at all. And that was really the core of the first week of lectures that I gave you. Then he said, on the other hand, if you can, so if you jump now to the second week, he then says, well, if you can, I can give you your numerical utility. You don't have to rely on this clumsy, bigger, you know, more than, less than, transitivity, con uh, concavity, blah, blah, blah. I can actually say, okay, that shopping trolley is worth 73.26 utils to you, and that one's worth 74.83, so you should take the second one, because it's bigger. And he actually said what economists were doing is sticking with this ranking, which is ordinal, rather than having a numerical, which is cardinal, for showing how primitive they were. He wanted to get rid of indifference curves completely from economic theory. That's what he wanted to do. Now, of course, that's not how economists treated it, as usual. So what he did, he said that using this non-numerical measure was actually a sign of how immature economics was. And he said, in, if you look back in physics, over time, there were times when we just simply had ordinal rankings of things rather than numerical values. But as science progressed, we started developing ways of measuring. And a good theory would lead to a way of measuring. So, for example, he said the precise me measurement of the quantity and quality of heat, energy and temperature respectively, were the outcome of good theory. So we worked out a decent theory. We then worked out how many joules of energy it took to raise a, um, a, um, what is it, a milliliter of water? I think it's the amount of, one joule of, I think is the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of one uh, milliliter of water from zero, one percent of the way from, from freezing to boiling. That was the gap. Okay? So you had a measure of zero for the freezing point, 100 for the, for the boiling point, and one joule of energy would raise the temperature from 0% above freezing to 1% above freezing. So we therefore no longer have to say, oh, that's hot and that's cold water. We can say that's, 38, that's 45 degrees and that's 16 degrees. We actually have a precise measurement for it. But if you go back far enough in time, all people could say that's hot water, that's cold water. Okay? So he's saying a good theory helps you develop a way of not just doing a ranking, which is ordinal, but actually having a quantitative measure, which is cardinal. Now, economists, of course, if you actually go back and take a look at any of the old textbooks, they say, oh, there's no way that you can develop a cardinal measure of utility. But I'm going by no one say, yes, you can. Simple. What you do is gambles with objective probability. Now, the reason it has to be objective, I'll explain in a second with the example here, um, is, well, is, is there's a big difference between how you behave when giving a subject a chance versus an object that I've shown you earlier just with money. But von Neumann was aware of one problem, and that is that this idea of working out a numerical model has got the same problem as I showed you in the first lecture that indifference curves have. Now, economists didn't even think about it. Remember how Samuelson goes straight into all those, you know, axioms of revealed preference without considering whether, you know, what happens if you have 65,000 commodities to compare, or even, even 50, as I showed you in the first week. Now, von Neumann said one may doubt whether a person can always decide which of the two alternatives he or she prefers. So he's aware of the comparability. Now, I wish at this stage that von Neumann had actually done the math. Because believe me, he could have done the mathematics. He would have concluded that you simply can't do it, and why bother with the whole thing? But instead he said, even if you can, then the same problem applies to both the numerical ranking he's about to show you how to do, and the, the ordinal stuff that economists have stuck with for indifference curves. So he said, if problems exist, you can't do either, but if it doesn't exist, mine's better. That sort of story. So here's his idea. Um, he said, we can work out a precise numerical measure of how much somebody how much utility somebody gets. We can actually create something you might call a util as a unit of measurement. So he said, if you look at what the, the Samuelson stuff does, that talks about completeness. 
and being able to rank A better than B, B better than A or B and different. But he's saying there's actually a number we can assign to the utility you get from a particular basket where you can say the numerical utility from shopping trolley A is bigger than the numerical utility from shopping trolley B. And having done that, well, the next one is transitivity. He said, yes, well, okay, we can say transitivity here, but we can also say, like, let's say one gives you, one trolley gives you uh, 100 utils and the other gives you 110. Then if I say there's a 0.9 chance of getting one with 110 versus nothing, I can say that's going to be equivalent to getting the one with 100 utils. And I'll show you that's how you work out this numerical measure later. And then all the other stuff, non-satiation and convexity, they probably apply, but it doesn't matter. Okay? You can still be rational, according to von Neumann's measure, just by going for things which give you more utility in a measurable way. The basic idea was to assign some arbitrary value, some arbitrary number of commodities. I've got an idea. Why don't we say zero is worth nothing? Okay, so no bananas is worth zero utils. And you can have, you have multiple commodities in here as well. I'm just taking that as an illustration. And therefore give arbitrarily also say that one banana is worth one util. Okay. Then, and that's just like the freezing point stuff for working out the temperature, then offer the repeated gamble. Because again, let's say you are absolutely at starvation point. You know, you got, if you don't get some food in the next five, five minutes, you're going to die. And I give you a choice of banana for certain, or a 99% chance of getting two bananas, but a 1% chance of getting none at all. Most people take the one banana, okay? So it can't be subjective. It must be a case of, oh, well, I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. You know, what trade-up am I willing to have between getting a banana every day versus, uh, you know, 99% of the time I'll get two bananas, and 1% I might not. I'll take the Dan Gamble, thanks very much, and repeat that for the rest of my life. That's why it has to be a repeated gamble. So you're given the choice of a repeated gamble of one banana for certain, or alpha odds of getting two versus one minus alpha odds of getting zero. Without any issues about, you know, if you, if you choose the alpha percent odds, you will get two bananas alpha percent of the time, okay, indefinitely. So if you say, well, if you're going to offer me a 70% chance of getting two versus a 30% chance of nothing against getting one for certain, at that level, I'm easy about which whether I'll choose one or I'll choose the gamble. We said that in that case, you can now assign a value to two utils. So you know one banana is worth one util. Let's say in this case I'm saying 60% here. Well, you sold uh, at the 60% point, you'll take the gamble. 61% for sure, 59% you won't, you know, just that's, that's the crossover point. Well, at that level, you can therefore say that one banana therefore gives you 0 0.6 times the utility of two bananas. So it's quite easy to convert that and say, therefore, the utility of two bananas, just provide through, is 1.67 neutrals. So you've now got a numerical value for the utility of two bananas, and one, and zero. Okay. And you keep on repeating it, you've got your marginal utility as well, Keep on repeating it, and you then go from zero, two for certain versus zero and three, three for certain versus zero and four, etc., etc. And you then, having done that, you can now assign a, a numerical utility to one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six bananas, whatever you know, the throw in the biscuits, anything else you like. You can work out this numerical utility. So the basic idea is uh, this is done in a spreadsheet here. And I won't go through because I've got a long, a long lecture tonight, but the basic idea is I've shown you how to work out the utility of one and then two, that's over here. Then you feed that into the utility of two over here and do the same calculation with three. Then you've got the utility of three bananas and you repeat the same thing over here for the utility of four and so on. Graph it ultimately and you get a graph like that. The black line is your total utility, the red line is your diminishing marginal utility. But it's numerical. So that's what that's what he wanted to do. So you can actually have cardinal expected utility. And what Neumann wanted this to be was a replacement for indifference curve analysis. Now clearly he lost, but they're still shoving the stuff down your throats in third year micro six decades later. Okay. Actually worse, six and a half decades later. So they ignored the numerical idea completely, and they'll still put textbooks out where they say you cannot give a numerical measure for utility. If they haven't read, this so often happens, they haven't read this particular reference. They then combined these ideas that came out of von Neumann and Merkel and Senate expected return 
and expected utility with the existing theory of indifference curves and so on, and that's what gave us modern finance theory. It was always a mess. And this again is why I get you to go back and read the original, because it lets you realize just what a real mess this theory has become over time. So they then said they, they could use this idea of expected utility, that is gamble, applied with subjective probability when it should have been objective, okay, to work out a theory of finance. Quite tragic. Now there's, you know, you've heard of Sharp and the capital asset pricing model, Medigliani Miller, Markowitz, blah, 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 the totalizing theory, all that sort of stuff. They call it modern only because it was modern compared to explanations beforehand that actually were rather behavioral. So they wasted our time for 50 years, we're now back doing behavioral finance again, having proven this stuff doesn't work. Um, but it worked for a while because it seemed to explain what the old theory couldn't. But, of course, 50 years later, pardon, actually makes that a more, let's just let's be a bit of fun here, I can't resist this, pardon me. Sometimes I'm juvenile. And I've got a crash hot, having crashed. So let's look at the theory itself. And the idea was that you have got actually might jump the page, let's see. Yeah, here we go, pardon me. Okay. They took the idea of investing under under certainty, so you know the returns in the future, where there's some risk involved, using the idea of utility theory, the indifference curves that Bonomo wanted to get rid of. We say an investor is trying to maximize utility subject to a constraint where the utility is a positive function of return and a negative function of risk, which is measured by standard deviation. And the constraints, so what you think of the available investments out there, as seen by the individual investor. So it's not a case that it's what the market says is going to be the return and risk profile. It's what you think the return and risk profile is going to be. And it includes both the return, the risk, and the correlation with other assets. So there's the basic idea. We are back in indifference curve land again, with increasing utility going down towards the bottom axis because the lower the risk, the better, and the higher the return, so utility goes that way. Those are your indifference curves, profiles for a particular investor, and these are the opportunities, as also seen by that same investor, which are, you know, this might be investing in, I don't know, UWS stock, and that's University of Western New South Wales over here, IBM down here, etc., etc. And you only would bother with ones that are actually on the edge here because you can improve your situation by compared to Z by going this way with a higher return, that way with lower risk, or D with a bit of both. And so only the ones on the edge are going to be desirable. So that's the optimal combination for this particular investor because there's the edge and there's the highest indifference curve the investor could reach. So that's what the investor should buy. That's the beginning of the argument, buy the particular portfolio. But then a bit more detail goes into it. There have, that, that, that boundary has to be portfolios rather than individual shares. And this comes back to the idea of diversification. So let's take a look at it. If you have an investment which is just in one particular uh, asset, like you know, IBM shares, then you get the return on IBM and the standard deviation of IBM. If there's another one containing Facebook, you get the expected return on Facebook, not looking too crash hot right now, and the variation, pretty high. And see some combination of IBM and Facebook. Alpha, that should be A, alpha and mi one minus alpha, pardon me, I'll change that later. Uh, what you're going to get is the expected return is going to be the linear combination of the two returns, given the amount you buy of each share. But the standard deviation is going to be this mess, because it's both the variance, it's the variance of the overall portfolio, that is a combination of the variance due to IBM and the variance due to Facebook, plus the correlation between the two. Okay. Now, you can then say, well, what's going to be the, what's the shape of that relationship? Well, if the correlation is perfect, so IBM and Facebook move in exactly the same way, then C lies in a straight line between A and B, because that's one. You therefore factor it out, to remove it rather. You've now got this term which you can factor. When you factor it, you get the square root of all that stuff squared. Take the square root, and your volatility, or your your standard deviation is going to be a linear sum of the of standard deviations of the two separate shares. Another straight line relationship. So you have a straight line relationship for risk, a straight line relationship for effective return, and therefore C is going to lie in a line, a straight line between A and B. Now what about if there's 
some is no correlation at all. Because he had, he had a totally negative correlation as well, of course. Well, that therefore means this term is zero. Which means this whole thing is zero. So what you've got left with is just the front bit. And that is necessarily less than the square root of the full term. The straight line relationship. Therefore your risk has fallen. So the lower risk from diversifying your portfolio means you've got the same combination of expected return but a lower level of risk. So therefore your combined portfolio lies down here somewhere. Given that, that, can, that this line here could never be on the efficient portfolio. So all the stuff on the edge has to be portfolio, not individual shares. That's the sort of clever one one of the clever parts of this particular paper. Now we get into some of the not so clever parts of the paper, or we're clever as in the sort of stuff that the lunatic does and tries to get away with, which he did for 50 years. That's where you assume there's a riskless asset which you can borrow at limitless amounts of money or lend. So there's no banks in the neoclassical way of thinking about the world. We all just lend and borrow to each other. And this assumes we can all lend or borrow an infinite amount of money at the same rate of interest. Now, it may be possible to say your riskless rate will be somewhat different to somebody else's riskless rate at this stage. Okay, So you can assume to borrow as much as you like at your own personal riskless rate. Maybe you're affecting your credit worthiness and so on. So that means you can combine you can combine your that portfolio of, of a riskless asset with whatever risky assets you most like. So the question is which risky assets are you going to like? We're going to like the ones that give you the best possible combination of risk and return. So given what you perceive, you can make up a portfolio involving this or any of the in a straight line, which is just the borrowing factor, along any of these any of this area. So the only one you should really bother taking is one of the highest possible return. So you can, as an investor, choose to combine that rate of return, which is your personal rate of return, with the best portfolio you can get. And you're going to be way down here if you're totally risk averse, or way up here if you're a, a total thrill seeker. Okay, so you've moved away from the um, leverage that's letting you take that and lever it out for extra gain, or be conservative down here. That's the basic idea at that point. All of that? So that's the only portfolio, only asset you should buy is theta. You shouldn't touch anything else. Now, that's so far a theory of a single investor. But of course, the riskless rate will depend upon, you know, even if such a thing exists, depends upon your own credit worthiness. And also, what you think you should invest in depends upon what you think are going to be the returns of different shares. So Fred Nurk might think that's where RBM and BHP belong. Bill Gates might think it's, uh, it's the other way around. Okay. So there's a range of different clouds out there and a range of different interest rates. So how do we aggregate that? What do you reckon he does? The ACMs are all the same. Aggregate by pretending exactly the same thing as I showed you last week over the um, slanish on mantle Brewer conditions. So he said in order to achieve con conditions for equilibrium, Again, this obsession with getting an equilibrium outcome. We have, have make, make two assumptions. First, we assume a common pure rate of interest. So all investors can borrow or lend on equal terms. So you and Janie Packer can both borrow a couple of billion dollars at the same rate of interest. I don't think. And secondly, homogeneity of investor expectations. He actually thanked the referee for suggesting this term. It sounds better than believing we all have exactly the same delusional belief. He said investors are assumed to agree on the prospects for all investments. So nobody has any, we all think that IBM is going to return 7% per annum uh, with a 2% standard deviation and have a 33% correlation with CSR. And he says obviously that's unrealistic. But the proper test of a theory is not how realistic its assumptions are, but I love this statement, the acceptability of its implications. Now even that's, this is a bastardized version of Friedman's methodology, which I talk about in History of Economic Thought. Why is it acceptable? Well, they imply a result, an equilibrium theory of finance, which is part of what we already believe. Therefore, we should use it. That's how strong the justification was for trying the theory out. So what he was appealing to is this idea that Friedman gave us that 
you're not trying to get a theory that actually describes reality. You simply want to have a theory which gives you good predictions. That's what Samuelson said, predictions. What he's saying, it has acceptable implications. That's not even the same thing as good predictions. It's wankier. It's walking and walkier. So I think what's actually going on here, strictly speaking, is proof by contradiction once more. If you only get a capital asset market line, if investors have identical with investors, then there is no capital line market line. The whole idea that you can do it is just flawed. You can't get there. And it could have been a step towards a more general model. You could have started from that point and said, okay, that's unrealistic. Let's relax the assumption and see if we can develop a new theory, which would have been a valid way to proceed. But that's not what he did. He kept on going on that basis. So we have a counterfactual set of assumptions. We all agree with each other, and we can borrow as much as we like. But the real punchline, and I'll establish this in next week's uh, lecture, I think, is that we also assume we're all correct about the future. Now, it could have been a theory that says we have the same assumptions and limitless capacity to borrow, and we make mistakes. That would have been better. But no, limitless capacity to borrow, exactly the same expectations, and they're all correct. So we have a theory of finance which assumes that everybody who invests in the stock market is Nostradamus. Hardly amazing that it fell apart. But having done that, he then said, well, no, but they've got exactly the same cloud. We've got exactly the same P. Therefore, that P theta Z line is the same for everybody. And since it's the same for everybody, everybody buys it. And the only thing way we differ now, the only way you can see is we can differ, is some of you are thrill seekers and others are risk averse. So all you can do is distribute yourself along this line, either very close to the horizontal axis if you're really conservative, therefore you mainly lend rather than borrow, or way out the top if you're really a thrill seeker. And therefore that's all the stuff you've been told about how to pick a portfolio for individual investors. So here's three people. There's a highly risk averse person, there's a thrill seeker, there's somebody who's risk neutral, but they all have to buy that one asset, just go back up again, they're all buying this asset. So what do you reckon happens to that portfolio? It gets more expensive. And other portfolios get cheaper. This is another clever part of the paper. So the price of all those assets that are in theta will rise, therefore their return will fall. And the price of assets not in theta will fall, therefore their return will rise. And therefore you shift all the expected returns around, and ultimately you get a new pattern which means there's a whole lot of portfolios that are efficient, not just one. So you can buy anywhere you like between A and B and still be buying an efficient portfolio. And that's the capital market line. Now bear in mind that doesn't exist if you take into account the realistic assumptions that uh, he talked about late, earlier. Now the next clever bit of it says how do you relate that from a portfolio to individual investments. We know it's a portfolio on the, on the uh, border there. So you, have to, you, you, you can't relate the expected return of an asset to its risk alone, but you can relate its expected return to systematic risk. And the way this is done, I'll go through this quickly because it's not an essential thing. It's showing you where beta came from. Um, the investment, let's say I for IBM, can be part of a portfolio that includes IBM. Now, if you invest extra in IBM or less in the portfolio, you can end up with just IBM. Okay? That's, you see, it's just because solely, if alpha is equal to 1, so you buy everything in IBM, all you bought is IBM shares, you haven't got the portfolio. If alpha is equal to 0, you bought the portfolio, so you've still got some IBM shares. I mean, alpha would be negative, which means you're actively not investing in the portfolio overall, to have no investment in IBM at all. So only one of those is efficient. So that's where you are for the efficient combination. There's investing just in IBM. And having done that, you can now use the tangency there to work out a relationship between the expected return of a particular share and the risk and, risk and volatility relations with the rest of the market. So there's your beta. It's the correlation of an individual asset with, a, with an efficient portfolio multiplied by the ratio of its standard deviation to the market portfolio multiplied by the gap between the market portfolio's return and the uh, risk-free asset. That's, that's the straight calculation of beta. So all the stuff you see in the papers publishing betas, that's what the beta coefficient is. You seen that before? Not sure. Okay. Yeah, probably. 
It's it, moderately clever. Moderately clever. So there's one saying, therefore you've now got your risk peculiar to a particular asset is off to the tangent off that market return. And the further out you are, the higher the return you get, but the higher the volatility you've got to put up with. So the whole argument is a risk return trade off in the market. And I'll go into that and whether it holds up in future uh, lectures. So you can't get away from systematic risk, but you can, you know, uh, tailor where you go to depending upon the rate of return and the correlation of the asset with the, with the market return. So if you want a higher return, you've got to put up with a higher volatility. That's just the straight message of Cap M. Now, Medically, Arnie Miller go on further and say that the debt structure of the firm doesn't affect its value, and you get the efficient markets hypothesis, which really tells you not to try to pick time the market because you can't, so it says, but to just tailor people's investments to their own preferences for risk versus return which is the whole industry of financial advising, with the argument that all you're focusing upon is risk and return. So, but it's based on believing you've got a common pure rate of interest and homogeneity of investor expectations. Now, interestingly enough, again, one reason it's worth reading the originals is that clearly that those assumptions, to use the French term, are bullshit. Okay, total. Total merit. And here's him admitting to it. People often really hold passionately passionate beliefs that are not universal. So the person who's selling an IBM share is convinced it's worth less than its current price. The person buying it is convinced it's worth more. Otherwise you wouldn't have trade. Fundamentally, this, they have a theory of the stock market that involves no trade. We all agree with each other. Why would you sell if you all agreed with each other? Why would there be any trade at all in the stock market? They can't even explain the existence of the market. But he says, if we try to take, be more realistic, what actually happens? Well, if you actually accommodate aspects of the reality, they're likely to be disastrous in terms of the usability of the theory. This is the bloke who developed the theory, saying if you take into account reality, you destroy the theory. Not a good theory. So the capital market line disappears. There's no single optimal combination of assets. There's no security market line. Quote, unquote, the theory is in a shambles. Now, you don't see that in the textbooks, do you? Because most economists have, well, I say, swallowed the neoclassical Kool Aid, and they've got a, what, they, what seems to be a neat and plausible explanation of the real world, and the neatness and the plausibility seduces them before they look at is it right or is it wrong? But it's clearly wrong. So you've been taught in an unconscious way an ideological theory not one that actually fits reality. And it's tragic that that's happened. Now, part of the reason why it did was for a while, the theory seemed to favour, the data seemed to favour the theory. So they got away with it because empirically they got some results that looked okay, even though the assumptions are stupid. Um, yeah, maybe, look, the data actually supports it a bit. Okay, So they found that there was a return, relationship between volatility and return. Uh, it did appear that people were doing some sort of trade-off investment. But I'm going to argue in the second half of the lecture that those results are actually a fluke. We'll take a look at why then with about a 10-minute break. <laughs>